Hello, and welcome to the Biomass Magazine podcast. I am your host, Anna Simmet. Thanks so much for tuning in. Today we have with us my friend, Greg Stangel, and he is CEO of Phoenix Energy, which is a developer of community-scale bioenergy and carbon removal facilities in California. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for appeasing my request and coming on to chat with us today. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. So, Greg, I think a great way to start would be, you know, for those who don't know, could you give us some background on Phoenix Energy and tell us what you guys are all about? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, we got our start in a, uh, a really odd way. We were working over in Central Europe and we're in the boiler space, having uh, acquired a company to do that. And so we were taking out coal furnaces and putting in high efficiency natural gas. And one of our customers was the Polish Air Force. And when they got into NATO, the Russians threatened to shut the gas off. And so the Air Force came to us and said, what do you know about biomass? And that was how we got into the the biomass business. And, uh, you know, fast forward a a few years and I I married a lovely woman from California who had about that much chance of living in Poland. So we came back to California and uh, shortly thereafter set up Phoenix Energy. So here we focus exclusively on the biomass gasification space. So we take community scale biomass plants. So, you know, well, it's pejorative, but I kind of joke your grandfather's biomass are those, you know, 30, 25 megawatt combustion plants. And and we make sort of in the three to five megawatt range of gasification where we take that wood and we make hydrogen out of it. And at the moment we convert that hydrogen into electricity. Uh, and biochar. We built four assets here in in California, and hopefully, 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 very soon, we will be announcing the closing of financing on our fifth project here in California. That's really exciting. So I have to ask, why the focus on these smaller scale plants? You know, why not the 10 or 15? And then why are you focused on California? Absolutely. Several, several reasons. Some of them are hysterical and and others (laughs) I think are are quite valid. You know, one is in my previous career, I was on airplanes all the time. And uh, I really enjoy the fact that uh, I can drive to any of our projects and sleep in my own bed. But really, the actual reason about why this really works in California is we're the only people crazy enough to pay European style, you know, 40 cents a kilowatt prices for energy. And so if all the programs and all the subsidies and nobody cared that it was renewable, if all that went away, you know, biomass is obviously not the cheapest way to make a kilowatt uh, of electricity. But if you're paying 40 cents and it costs us 12 there's a pretty big spark spread in there where it can be the right thing for the customer and, and the right thing for us. And so that, you know, for us, I I hear all the time, you know, we would never do a project in California. And I kind of say we would never do a project outside of California. In fact, once when at our first pilot plant in Merced in 2010, we had the state of Alabama send out a whole delegation about, you know, Alabama's 80% forested and won't you please come to Alabama and and help us with our biomass issue. And it was sort of great. How much will you pay us for the juice? And they said, well, in Alabama, power's power's a nickel. And, uh, you know, we told them to enjoy Disney on their way out of the state because we can't get out of bed for a nickel. And and we can't, you know, biomass is, is not the cheapest way but biomass is about so much more than a kilowatt, right? Biomass is about dealing with organic waste or organic residues or public safety from wildfire or avoiding the burning of agricultural residues. It's about biochar production and helping farmers deal with water insecurity or helping municipalities deal with uh, stormwater management. You know, it's it's about so much more than a kilowatt. You know, we make the economics work several different ways. 
the reason why we believe smaller is better in biomass is, well, shoot, we don't have to put fuel on a truck. You know, it costs a lot of money. You know, we like to joke, there's nothing more expensive than free wood in a forest. You know, moving that product is very, very expensive. Moving energy is also very expensive. And so, you know, we try to keep everything local. We try to keep the power usage on site as much as we can. You know, we don't make a lot of stuff in California, so it's kind of hard to find uses for electricity, particularly in the Sierra. Um, but uh, by staying, by getting small and get close to the fuel and close to the load, and close to the jobs, you know, we find that we're able to make the numbers work better than you can on a large facility. You know, that said, the counter argument is, oh my God, if you would have explained to me what you have to give to make a project like this get done, I probably would have stayed in banking and uh, <laughs> left biomass to the uh, professionals. Well, you are a professional now. Yeah, it's the uh, too dumb to quit part of our <laughs> mantra that has led us to become yeah, experts. I I, uh, I reckon we're uh, we're coming up on twenty years now in the space, and I I hate that every time I get on LinkedIn, it reminds me. Uh, I thought we were going to be out of here in five years, but uh, <laughs> you know, there you go. Mm -hmm. I hear you. Well, those are some great points, Greg. I think that's a good segue into your North Fork plant. You know, it recently came online, and I know that this was a very long road from all the discussions we've had you know, over the years. So what would you say were the biggest challenges in getting this plant up and running? And then also it's kind of a two-part question. Can you talk about the additional sites that you have planned? Oh, absolutely. The biggest challenge in getting this plant up and running was finance. And this is really embarrassing for me because I come out of the equity investing world. Right. My my mm -hmm. former career, you know, I was a private equity investor. I mean, this was a long time ago. So uh, I was a junior guy at, at, a, at an equity investment fund. And I thought finding equity for these projects would be a cinch. And the truth is, everything we built, we built 100 percent debt. And that is not the smartest way to finance uh, large assets. Because of the nature of the cash flows that come from our energy production uh, and the nature of the tax credits, we're able to do uh, basically 100% debt transactions where you sort of back out of the debt when the tax credits monetize at the end of, of construction. Now, again, that's not for lack of trying. But what we found, and literally with some arrogance, I just thought I was going to waltz down Sand Hill Road in 2007 and raise a crud ton of money and go build a bunch of these really cool gasification plants all over uh, the U.S. And what happened is everybody wanted to talk about this stuff. And quite frankly, they still do. Everybody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to do it. And the minute we got the question, explain to me how biomass is like a solar project, mm -hmm. you know, that's where you just learn to stand up and leave the room because <laughs> biomass ain't anything like a solar project. You know, right. these are loud assets that make loud noises and I get to wear my hard hat, which I love and, and be around equipment that requires hearing protection, which I love. You know, this is not a solar panel on a roof. Uh, this is a facility that employs people you know, 24 seven, you know, so that, that part of it, I, I think was a challenge, but, mm -hmm. but again, the nature of these cash flows where most of them come from a 20 year contract from a utility, mind you, a utility that's filed for bankruptcy twice in my lifetime, my working lifetime, mm -hmm. but that doesn't seem to bother anybody. And that has enabled us to, to bring a significant amount of debt capital to bear on these projects. Now, now what has changed is that, you know, COVID gave us a swift kick in the teeth and everything got 50% more expensive. At the same time, quite frankly, we were saved because that's when people started to care about carbon. You know, our assets have been carbon negative since we built the first one in 2003 
It's just that nobody cared about that until last Thursday. But the fact that now we can monetize those ecosystem services, that's really, quite frankly, kept the dream alive. So we, you know, generate largely owing, well, entirely owing to the biochar, right? So as gasification, we don't burn wood, we sort of bake it until it becomes solid carbon. And we take that solid carbon and we sell it. But because we basically put carbon in the ground, that piece of paper that comes with it, which is hysterical when you think about it, is now worth more than the actual product itself, which is truly surprising. All right. What about your additional sites? Any progress on those? Oh, yeah, a- absolutely. So we have a, a shovel-ready site that is uh, slightly larger than North Fork. It's a three-megawatt project going into the town of Wilseyville. And we recently were awarded a contract with the city of Napa on a project there. So now these are all projects that have been our pipeline for some time. Uh, And so it's that steady progression of, you know, projects moving along the development pathway. And I guess that is sort of our reward for being dumb enough to enter this business so early is that we do have a fairly well-developed pipeline of assets that are now, you know, that have percolated through the permitting system. That makes sense. So you had, you've mentioned biochar um, a few times. Yeah. Um, And, you know, we chatted for a story several years ago. I won't say how many, um, I won't date us. Uh, You had mentioned how valuable it was. And you told me that essentially, you know, it was paying the bills. And I'm wondering, has that held true? Absolutely. It's it's a great story. Uh, When we put that first little 500 kilowatt unit online in Merced in uh, in 2010, and man, I thought that thing was just going to come out of the box and work. Ouch. I think in our first year of operations, we were lucky if we put 2000 hours on that sucker and that just doesn't get you there. But biochar was so valuable at that time that it saved us. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm just one of those people that was dumb enough. You know, when we started, I thought biochar was a waste product. And quite frankly, at the first unit we built in Europe, it wasn't good for anything other than burning it as you would coal. Like we just sold it to people who were using coal at a boiler in the basement of a hospital. Here, burn this and, and instead of coal. Uh, But biochar for about a decade sold for 79 cents a pound. And what has happened is as carbon credits have come into fashion, we've seen the price of carbon credits skyrocket. At the same time, we've seen the inverse happen in the price of the actual underlying commodity, biochar. I really struggle with how that happened because to have 10 years of sales and repeat customers at a, at a product that provides a valuable environmental service that, you know, farmers recognized that municipalities recognized. Now the, the little piece of paper that says you did a good thing carbon wise has, has really created an environment where it's driving so much on the supply side that, we're seeing the the price for that biochar really go through the floor at the time that the price for the credits that get attached to it is really going through the ceiling. Huh. So, you know, I I hate to say it, but at the one time, the nameless tech company that we all know that purchased credits is our our greatest hero and uh, at the same time is creating our greatest problem with uh, the price of biochar. Mm-hmm. Oh, so interesting. Um, so you're talking about carbon credits and what are, what are you doing there? I think I recently saw you guys made an announcement regarding carbon credits, didn't you? Yeah, we did. We did. We just signed uh, another transaction with Carbon Future, which is a, a great company. And, and look, there are many great companies out there in this space. And this is why you know, look, I don't mean to whine. It, and, and it's funny because I'm the only guy who's uh, been in the space long enough, I think, to remember when biochar was a highly valued commodity. 
and and so I'm I'm kind of stuck in the past that way. But what's unique is that by turning that value into a contract, you know, biochar was never something that got an offtake, right? There is no 10-year sales contract for biochar. You can get a 10-year sales contract for carbon credits. Uh, and that makes that revenue higher quality and more bankable. So net net, there's a sort of silent benefit in that the the great uh, shoot. I, I hope I'm not insulting anybody because I'm going to pay for it later. But you know the large infrastructure funds uh, in New York, you know they look at biochar and they just see a big fat zero despite a 10 year sales track record, right? But when you can turn that into a three-year contract with a big name you know, that they value. And, and so it's actually made the assets more easily financeable, even if the trade financially is not as good, right? When the biochar was super high, we made more money than when carbon credits went from zero to, you know, I mean, I think now carbon credits for biochar are going for upwards of $170 a ton. That's, you know, like, look, they've been a goose egg for uh, as long as I can remember. Our first contract we ever signed for carbon credits was $2.40. And so we've gone from $2.40 to $170 a credit in in just a couple of years. That's that's, that's pretty crazy. Cool. But, you know, biochar, you know, going from going from 80 cents to 40 cents, that's been, uh, at least for me, painful to watch. Mm -hmm. But biochar did not help us with financeability and carbon credits do. Right. Huh. So, well, it's a, you know, it's, it's a mixed bag. Yeah. Very well explained, though. So. Greg, um, I know that you and I could keep talking for at least another hour, but to wrap things up, what is Phoenix Energy most excited about right now? I would say right now, we're most excited about interest rates coming down. As debt folks, or, or what we've become debt folks, the, the high interest rates really put a damper on things. The other thing that we are most excited about is a continuing ability to monetize the environmental attributes of what we do, right? Biomass is more than an electron. Biomass is more than a kilowatt. But nobody ever wanted to pay for anything other than just the kilowatt. And what we're seeing now is, is an immutable move towards valuing those ecosystem services. And I think that really opens up a lot of revenue opportunities for us going forward as energy prices inevitably on the wholesale side will trend downward. So I, I think that is, is really exciting for us. We're finding a lot of other opportunities. This Blue Mountain Project, we have this amazing partnership with the Calaveras County Water District. And these guys are under the gun. You know, they've got to electrify their fleets. They've got to decarbonize these critical infrastructure assets. And here we are, you know, right on property, ready to help them do that. And that was something that before, you know, we hadn't even thought of. But we're, we're seeing a lot of other reasons to assist people, particularly with electric vehicles and other types of ways that we can keep energy on site and that makes us less reliant on utilities and you know less exposed to inflationary pressures so really uh you know i, I hate telling you it's a jam tomorrow story because if you talk to my wife she's a little tired of jam tomorrow <laughs> but that really excites us about you know the near term medium term for where we're headed with these assets well, great answer, Greg, and I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's been great having you, and I look forward to chatting again in the future for an update. You got it, Anna. I'm looking forward to it. Thanks again. Thanks again for you and what you guys do to, to keep a spotlight on this. Absolutely. 
And to our listeners, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Until next time.